Home visiting encompasses a range of home-based interventions for working with families at risk of child abuse and neglect, substance abuse, and other high-risk behaviors or debilitating conditions. Home-based interventions are considered especially helpful for serving hard-to-reach, isolated families, since they remove common barriers to receiving treatment, such as transportation and child care. Further, by meeting clients in their natural environment, you can learn more about daily routines and family dynamics than you generally could in an office setting. Home visiting is a practice that allows workers to literally and figuratively meet and accept families where they are at. This training is an introduction to home visiting for those new to the field and will focus on home-based services for families affected by substance abuse and HIV. This training is not intended to supplant the mission, theoretical framework, or service model and protocols adopted by your agency. Rather, it is an attempt to provide an orientation to the basic skills, issues, and practical information you will need to know in your work as a home visitor. The training will cover many of the components of home visiting, from scheduling to documenting visits, as well as how to prepare for potential challenges. First, we'll provide a general overview of home visiting before delving into more details that will help you understand and carry out your responsibilities as a home visitor. There is no prototypical home visiting model. In fact, home visiting programs can vary greatly on many key components. Even with this variety, nearly all home visiting programs have aspects in common too. Often the overall focus of these programs is on enhancing parent-child interactions and improving the safety and quality of the home environment. Some home visiting programs employ professionals as home visitors, while others employ paraprofessionals or peer workers who may have had similar backgrounds and experiences of their clients. Regardless of the type of home visitor used, staff members need to be properly trained, culturally competent, and adequately supervised. You will want to familiarize yourself with your own home visiting program's agenda and priorities. Once you understand the goals and priorities of your agency, you will be ready to learn how your role fulfills the agency's mission. While you may not necessarily have control over the design of your home visiting program, it is helpful to know about the components of home visiting programs that have been shown to be effective. First, these programs are likely to be more successful when there is a clear connection between the desired outcomes, as outlined in a client's case plan, and the specific intervention selected to achieve these ends. For example, if a family would like to foster language development in their infant or toddler, you might teach parents simple rhymes and songs to sing to their children. To help a child regulate emotions, you can role play with the parent the appropriate skills that they can later use with their children. The goals and objectives that you and the family decide to work on should guide each activity and intervention utilized during your visits. Other characteristics of an effective home visiting program include a strong parent training curriculum and case management and referral services. Furthermore, positive parent and child outcomes are more likely the more deeply you are able to engage the family in the home visiting services. The program should be of high intensity lasting at least one year with an average of four or more visits per month. The effectiveness of the program will also depend upon the correspondence between the client's needs and the program services. For example, programs serving clients with health needs might employ a nurse home visitor, while those serving immigrant clients should provide a home visitor who speaks the client's native language. If your clients have needs that are not met by your home visiting program, look for external resources to fill the gap. Program implementation is also a critical factor when considering program effectiveness. Even if the program's design has been shown to be effective, the program's impact will depend on how well the design is carried out. The intervention should be implemented precisely as it was intended by its designers. Make certain you are well informed about the goals and methods of delivering your home-based services. Regardless of program design, your effectiveness will likely depend on how committed you are to meeting your clients' needs, building positive relationships with your clients, reflecting on your practice, and continuously learning from your own experience and from other professionals. 
We will now talk about working with families affected by substance abuse and or HIV AIDS. We'll discuss some of the issues these families face and how you can help them progress. First, let's consider the concerns of families affected by substance abuse. Substance abuse is a medical condition and must be treated as such by the home visitor when approaching the client. These parents are doing their best given their circumstances and generally want what is best for their children. If you work with pregnant or new mothers, this may be an ideal moment to intervene since many women become motivated to improve their health for their children's sake. You may want to look for programs that are developed specifically for women and that are family focused. These programs will generally offer counseling for the individual and the family, child care, domestic violence services, parenting interventions, and social services assistance. Women may also feel more comfortable and derive greater benefits from women-only support groups. Many women who abuse substances have histories of trauma, such as sexual, physical, or emotional abuse. Therefore, the treatment should also be trauma-informed, developed specifically to accommodate the needs of survivors of abuse. Trauma-informed programs recognize the connection between the client's trauma history and their current symptoms, and they adapt their services so that they do not trigger re-traumatization. Research the available trauma-informed programs in your area with particular attention to those that tailor their services to pregnant or parenting women. During each visit, you will want to take note of behavioral signs of substance abuse in the parent or other adults in the home. You may also notice drug equipment and paraphernalia in the house or excessive stores of alcohol. Your clients might be abusing substances if they frequently cancel appointments, forget things easily, and have difficulty following through on agreed upon intervention activities. If you have developed sufficient rapport to discuss your client's addiction, approach the matter with empathy and respect. Provide the family with information on substance abuse treatment programs that can help. As you support the client through her recovery process, you should consider employing the following strategies. Remain attuned to her verbal and nonverbal emotional expressions and try to put yourself in her position. Acknowledge her experiences and feelings and normalize them. Avoid arguments and aggressive confrontation, which tend to increase client defensiveness and resistance to change. By authentically showing her you care, she is likely to become more engaged. Individuals, particularly women, are often introduced to drug use through their partners or significant others. The reverse is also true. A woman's partner can play a significant role in her motivation and ability to access treatment and remain clean and sober. Involving partners in the home visiting program can offer many advantages to the entire family, from better communication between the couple to stronger parent-child attachment. However, engaging partners can be challenging for a variety of reasons. If your client's current partner is abusing substances, help him or her find treatment and support too, emphasizing the importance of mutual sobriety for long-term recovery. To make such referrals, it will be beneficial for you to familiarize yourself with the treatment programs and support groups that serve men as well as those that serve women. The children of substance abusing parents have their own set of challenges that should not be overlooked. Some of the children who have been exposed to substances prenatally may have had a low birth weight or been born prematurely, resulting in physical, cognitive, emotional, and social complications. These complications may be unnoticed or untreated at this point. You can help these children by referring them to early intervention services. Research has demonstrated, however, that the home environment after birth has more of an effect on child growth and development than prenatal exposure to drugs. Thus, your contribution to the development of a healthy, safe, stable home environment for the children is critical. Substance abuse makes parenting a challenge. Generally, these parents love their children, but their illness sometimes prevents them from being fully present. Parents who abuse substances may have difficulty monitoring their children and being sensitive to their needs. Inconsistent care from the parent interferes with healthy parent-child attachment 
and can lead to the child's emotional withdrawal and parent-child conflict. This is where you can help. Assist the parent in accurately identifying the child's cues and needs. Coach the parent in practices that support their children, tailoring your suggestions to the specific needs of the child. You can also help parents prepare for the challenges they may face in caring for a child affected by substances. For example, the child may not provide the parent with positive feedback or may become easily overstimulated. Encourage parents to talk about their worries, uncertainties, and concerns. Connect the parents to any medical or educational resources that will support optimal child development and functioning. Helping families provide a sense of safety and a nurturing environment for their children will enhance both child development and parent-child relationships. We will now move to discussing home visiting services for families affected by HIV AIDS. Since this medical condition affects the entire family, family-centered home visiting programs are important for helping parents and their children navigate the challenges they face. This population has a unique set of needs and concerns. You may lighten the burden felt by parents with HIV AIDS by providing parenting education and assistance, supporting medication adherence, assisting them with legal issues, and connecting them to the needed resources. Given the often overwhelming number of challenges these parents face, home visitors working with families affected by HIV AIDS have found that their clients experience more positive outcomes when they make concerted efforts to keep the family engaged in services, give the family autonomy and decision-making power, and focus on the family's strengths. Interaction and coordination with medical and social service personnel is crucial to HIV-affected families, and you will likely serve as a critical liaison between these services. Assisting clients in obtaining medical treatment may be particularly important among low-income and minority clients who are less likely to seek care. Women with HIV AIDS need comprehensive gynecologic care from medical professionals with specialized expertise specific to HIV AIDS. Prenatal care is also critical if the client is pregnant. If she doesn't already have specialized medical care, help connect her to an HIV AIDS clinic. If she has a medical team, you can facilitate communication between members of this team and your client and also help her better understand her diagnosis and treatment. Patients with HIV AIDS have complicated medication regimens that often result in undesirable side effects. This poses barriers to medication adherence, as does substance abuse and or mental health problems. To maximize effectiveness, HIV medication needs to be taken precisely as it was prescribed. Even more importantly, if a woman is pregnant, transmission of HIV to the child can be prevented if the necessary precautions are taken. Research suggests that you, as a home visitor, can reinforce your client's medication adherence. Consider familiarizing yourself with common HIV medications and their side effects, the frequency of dosage, and ideal frequency of doctor visits. Once you have a baseline understanding of HIV medication and care, you can begin to assess for adherence. Ask non-judgmental questions about the woman's medical regimen, although be aware that clients often overestimate their adherence. Acknowledge that taking daily pills is universally challenging for many people and indicate that you may be able to help. Review the doctor's recommended regimen with her to be sure she knows exactly what she has been prescribed. Then inquire whether there is anything that makes taking the pills difficult. Also ask about side effects and any other problems she may be having with the medication. Once you know the barriers to adherence, you can work with the client to creatively address each difficulty. You can offer to discuss these concerns with her doctor to assess whether changing medications or simplifying the regimen would be possible and appropriate. You are not in a position to provide medical advice, but you can adopt methods of supporting your clients so they can adhere to and fully benefit from their medical treatment. You will want to consult your client frequently about her medications since her adherence may change as she confronts different challenges to taking the medications over time.
Parents and children affected by HIV AIDS commonly have psychological and social challenges associated with the illness and often experience stigma, isolation, grief, and depression. Mental health support for parents with HIV AIDS is critical to help them cope with their day-to-day -day realities of living with the illness, not only for their sake, but also because parental mental illness negatively affects childhood development. To make matters worse, intimate partner violence often arises in households impacted by HIV, and research demonstrates that it may occur more frequently and be more severe. You can offer the caregiver emotional support, validate her feelings, and offer coping mechanisms to help her manage her daily stressors. But if her mental health or other needs are beyond what you can address, refer her to an appropriate specialist. You might find that children affected by HIV have emotional and behavioral challenges. Since all of their mothers are HIV infected, these children must cope with the potential or actual loss of a parent and in cases of pediatric HIV infection, their own mortality. Their mother's illness may force some of these children to assume caretaking roles, leading to more absences from school, lowered school performance, and overall distress. You can talk to children about these burdens and help them develop strategies to manage them. Children with HIV need support to understand and cope with their futures. They can become empowered if they are given a developmentally appropriate role in making decisions affecting their lives. HIV-affected children can also benefit from therapy with a child mental health specialist. Support groups and age-appropriate group activities can be especially beneficial for these children who sometimes have difficulty forming bonds and relating to peers. When and how parents disclose their HIV diagnosis to their immediate family is also of great importance. Do not assume that your clients have disclosed their HIV status to their children or partners. The difficult decision to disclose involves weighing a multitude of pros and cons. This is a very sensitive, complex, and highly charged topic for all involved. When the caregiver with HIV is ready to share her status, you can refer her to a clinician with the necessary experience to facilitate the process. Research has shown that a significant number of HIV-infected parents and children are concerned about transmission of the virus within their household. The concern that HIV can be transmitted through blood contact is reasonable, but in many families, fear of transmission inhibits parents and children from engaging in interactions that do not transmit the virus, such as kissing, sharing food, or hugging. You can help alleviate these fears by assisting the parents and children in understanding how HIV is transmitted, as well as what behaviors are absolutely safe. Many clients with HIV AIDS will need an array of non-medical services. For example, women with HIV AIDS often find that support groups with other women in their circumstances are helpful, or that their children may qualify for early education programs like Head Start. Some parents will need legal services to handle issues related to breaches of confidentiality or discrimination in hiring, wages, or housing. HIV-infected parents will also need support in considering how their medical condition impacts their current and future ability to provide care for their children. In some states, parents can designate another adult to assume custody of their children once the parent is no longer able to care for them. If your program does not provide legal services for your clients with HIV, you should familiarize yourself with the appropriate resources in your community. There are additional issues you should be aware of when working with families affected by parental substance abuse and or HIV AIDS. First, these parents often have other mental health problems and many have been victims of sexual and physical abuse some are currently being abused by their partners. Therefore, you may need to refer parents to both a substance abuse treatment professional and a mental health specialist. Unfortunately, there are still many women who need substance abuse or mental health treatment who do not receive it, highlighting the important role you play in connecting clients to needed services. There's a multitude of additional factors families affected by substance abuse and or HIV AIDS face. 
They may also feel guilt, shame, and ostracism related to their illness. Your role involves helping them cope with and overcome these challenges, referring them to the community services as needed. Now we'll review some of the basic home visiting skills you will need as you prepare for your first home visit. An important initial procedure is scheduling the visit with the family. Scheduling may seem like a straightforward task, but several considerations should be made before picking up the phone. Ask yourself, what is the purpose of this visit? Is this my first meeting with the family? What do I hope to accomplish? Thinking about the type of visit you are scheduling will help you determine what you need to communicate and how long the visit will likely take. When establishing the day and time of the appointment, consider both what is most convenient for the family and what times would be best for observing typical routines and activities, since part of your responsibility is to assess daily activities in the home. Also allow plenty of time for travel, factoring in enough time to accommodate any potential delays. Avoid scheduling multiple consecutive visits. The work is intensive, so spacing your visits out allows you to be fully present during each visit and gives you time after each session to process and document what happened. You should always be prepared for last-minute cancellations, rescheduling requests, and no-shows. If the family cancels frequently or is unresponsive, inquire about barriers that may be preventing them from participating in the program. If there don't appear to be any noticeable barriers, speak to your supervisor about your attempts to engage the caregiver, possible additional approaches, the fit between the program and the family's needs, and how long you should persist in contacting them. Sometimes it will require significant perseverance to engage and maintain a family in the program. The relationship between home visitor and parent is the foundation of home visiting. It is considered vital to the intervention because it ultimately influences the quality of the parent-child relationship and the effectiveness of the program. Developing the relationship with the parent requires respect and trust, patience, open-mindedness, and cultural competence. It begins with the first contact you make with the family, but it takes time to build. Every family and worker is different, so every relationship you have with clients will be different. Each client's personality, values, and past experiences with social workers or agencies will affect how they interact with you. Likewise, your values, knowledge, skills, and past experiences with families influence your own interaction with new clients. It is important to involve the parent and other significant members of the family as full partners in the intervention. They are the experts regarding their own experiences and should be respected as equals in the home visiting process. As problems arise, you and the parents should engage in joint problem solving, defining the problem and then brainstorming solutions. You will want to show your concern, actively listen, validate the parents' feelings and experiences, and refrain from passing judgment. Put yourself in the position of the parent and their child and show empathy, patience, and nurturance. Monitor your tone and body language to demonstrate respect for the family. Over the course of the intervention, your relationship with the parent can be further facilitated by several practices. First, you can often readily connect to parents through your shared interest in the child. Bringing up the child's strengths conveys to the parent that you see value and potential in them. Showing your interest in the child's well-being also suggests to the parent that you share common goals. When addressing difficult subjects, use I statements as a safeguard against making statements that are inaccurate or threatening. For instance, you might rephrase, you have had some challenges recently, to, I appreciate that some challenges have come up for you recently. I statements communicate concern without being accusatory. Although these general approaches to home visiting will likely enhance the worker-family relationship, it is also helpful to individualize interventions for each family. Families have different needs, access to resources, social networks, and relations to you and the larger society. 
Some may be more open to your presence than others. Some parents may show resistance to the intervention or feel uncomfortable with having you in their residence. Remember that you are a guest in their home. Respect the family's space and comfort level and realize that some families may need more time to feel comfortable with you and trust you. Understanding the family's perspective, remaining flexible, and addressing the family's specific concerns are essential components of a personalized intervention and will facilitate rapport building. Working within a culturally competent framework is crucial for developing a sound worker-parent relationship and ensuring a successful intervention. Culture is a collection of customs, beliefs, and values that connect a group of people. However, identifying with a particular culture is more complex than simply being a member of a particular religious, racial, or social group. People's cultural orientation differs and is influenced by a variety of factors, including one's age, gender, language, immigration status, and affiliation with others in their community. Additional variation exists according to one's country of origin, length of time in the resident country, and degree of assimilation and acculturation. Consequently, it's important to remember that your interactions with each individual family will be unique. Culture can influence many areas of life, including how parents engage in the home visiting program. It may impact social roles, attitudes towards other people, body language and language use. For instance, in some cultures, direct eye contact is considered disrespectful so some clients may avoid making eye contact with you. In other cultures, it is customary to remove your shoes when you enter the home. You may also be offered gifts or food. You might feel uncomfortable taking such offerings, but some families consider the refusal of gifts to be disrespectful. Discuss with your supervisor how to approach situations in which agency policies conflict with the family's cultural practices. In addition to being conscious of different cultural traditions, be particularly sensitive to the fact that receiving home visiting services may be stigmatized in the family's community. Importantly, culture can also affect child rearing behavior, maternal sensitivity, and how parents respond to their children. Among some families, elevated voices and corporal punishment are accepted forms of discipline, while in other families, parents are more permissive. It is important to respect different cultural styles of parenting, as long as they do not conflict with the intervention's goals or constitute child abuse or neglect, according to the law. To prepare for your work with new clients, become familiar with the families and communities, history, traditions, help-seeking patterns and healing practices, language and communication styles, available resources, and relationship to institutions and to the larger society. But note that researching the family's cultural background through courses, books, or treatment guides is not enough. There are subtle differences within cultures. Approach the family with humility and a willingness to ask family members about their personal beliefs and practices. If these are not at odds with the home visiting program's goals or policies, incorporate the beliefs and practices into the intervention. Practicing cultural competence also involves demonstrating genuineness, empathy and warmth, accepting cultural differences, evaluating your practices in relation to your client's culture, and remaining flexible, thereby adapting your services to the different cultural patterns of behavior. Finally, you should reflect on your own culture and how your values, past experiences, and background interacts with your own family's culture. Being aware of your own beliefs and attitudes can help you to avoid stereotyping and appropriately monitor your interactions with parents. During the first visit, your objective will be to put the family at ease and get to know one another rather than addressing specific issues. It is also a time to clarify intentions and expectations, go over each person's role, and discuss the program's agenda. Your role is to be a listener, consultant, and guide, while the role of the parent is to be a partner in the learning process. You may encounter parents who try to give you absolute control over the intervention, but it is not necessary or even desirable to accept this position of authority. 
At the outset of the intervention, you should explicitly ask parents about what they expect or hope to gain from the program. You can then describe your intentions and establish appropriate limits regarding what you can offer. Be aware that there may be some services the family desires that are beyond the program's scope and agenda. In these instances, you should remain within the bounds of the program and refer the family to outside resources to address those needs. Familiarizing yourself with the community resources and agency partnerships is a key component to meeting families' needs. The first visit will also involve asking about the makeup of the family and the household. You will want to know who lives in the home, their relation, and the extent to which each individual is involved in the care of the child. During the home visiting intervention, it will be important to engage partners, siblings, grandparents, or anyone else in the home that plays an active role in the child's life. Some household members may not initially be motivated to be involved in the program. In those cases, identify possible barriers to participation. Offering reassurance to these family members, explaining your role and what you can do for the family, and providing them with concrete desired services may be strategies for connecting with them. Also, recognize these members as potential sources of strength in the household and convey to them the important role they can play in the intervention. They can also be the supports that mothers need to feel competent in their parenting. Fathers and father figures are particularly important to engage whenever possible. Like the mothers in your program, these men might need parenting instruction and support. Build on a man's strengths and communicate to him that he is wanted and needed in the intervention and in the child's life. He should understand that his role in the child's life is just as important as the mother's, and you should show him specific ways in which he can have a positive impact. Even men who do not seem to be involved in the children's lives might nevertheless value being a father and have the desire and capacity to become a better parent. By reaching out to fathers and father figures and showing them how they can support their children's lives, you can help improve the outcomes of the entire family system. The assessment process with the family can begin once you have established at least a basic rapport with them. Assessment is ongoing and facilitates a better understanding of the family's strengths and needs. It also helps you to develop goals for the case plan and track progress towards these goals. Parents typically know their children best, so they should always be a central informant for assessments. Although other important adults in the child's life can also offer valuable information about the child. Before speaking to others about the child, be sure to obtain a signed consent from the custodial parent. Many agencies have formal written assessments that you are to use with each family. It is good practice to familiarize yourself with your agency's forms and assessment tools before going to the client's home. To begin the assessment process, ask parents general questions about their experiences to identify desired resources and to list their priorities. Evaluations are also done by observing parent-child interactions and administering more formal, standardized assessments, such as checklists or structured interviews. When gathering information, pose open-ended questions, those without a yes or no answer, to obtain a more comprehensive understanding of the family's experiences. Gaining a better sense of the parent's situation and perspectives can help you to individualize the interventions. One type of assessment involves monitoring the conditions of the home and the state of the parent and child. Some programs have checklists to help determine the health and well-being of the family members and the home environment. For example, a checklist might ask you to look for developmentally appropriate toys and reading materials and note any safety concerns you observe. A general checklist will also likely involve assessment of the child's appearance. Similar questions can be asked about the parent's appearance too. You will most likely also assess the parent-child interaction. Knowledge gleaned from the various family assessments combined with the expressed needs and priorities of the client contribute to the development of a comprehensive case plan. 
The case plan will outline the client's goals and determine which interventions will be most beneficial for the family. While the aim of home visiting programs is ultimately to enhance the health and well-being of young children, meeting the parents' needs in the realm of physical and emotional health, social support, education, employment, finances, and housing is often a prerequisite and commonly incorporated into the case plan. Remember that what you consider to be the family's biggest challenge may not be in line with the parent's perception. Informed by your assessment, the case plan should reflect not only the overarching goals of your specific program, but the individual needs of specific family members as well. The case plan should be referred to often so the family can track their progress and celebrate their successes. Assessment doesn't end after the initial forms are completed. Many programs suggest conducting assessments at regular intervals to document change over time. In addition, at each visit, you should be looking for signs that the child and parent are safe and not in any danger. In the following discussion, we'll mention some indicators for child abuse, domestic violence, and other safety concerns. If you notice any of these warning signs, you will want to share them with your supervisor immediately to determine a course of action. As a home visitor, you are a mandated reporter for child abuse. This means you must report suspected abuse in the home to your state child welfare agency. It is important for you to share this stark reality, your obligation to report child abuse and neglect with the parent from the get-go. Always remember, your obligation to protect the child outweighs your duty to the parent. It is important for you to be informed. Check with your supervisor and learn about your agency's specific protocols for formally reporting child abuse and neglect. Signs of abuse may be evident in the behavior of the child or parent or in the parent-child interaction. Children who are abused may demonstrate physical or behavioral changes. Those who are neglected may lack adequate clothing, food, or medical care, have consistently poor hygiene or dirty clothes, or be left unsupervised. These children may also display significant developmental delays. Parents who abuse or neglect might blame the child for problems at home, feel their child is a burden to them, demonstrate little concern or empathy for the child, abuse substances, or behave erratically. Parents who abuse or neglect their children may have one or more of the following conditions. Child abuse or neglect does not necessarily mean that the parent does not love the child. The abusive parent may not intend to hurt the child, but may be overwhelmed by their stressors and lack healthy coping strategies. Nonetheless, these underlying circumstances never excuse the abuse or neglect. If you suspect child abuse or neglect, you should follow your agency's protocols for making a formal Child Protective Service report. Remember that such a report will not only protect the child, but can also lead to services that will help the entire family. As a home visitor, you will become part of the child protection team, helping the parent improve her relationship with the child. This can involve coaching and instructing parents to use positive reinforcement, reflect back and build upon the child's actions and speech, and demonstrate enthusiasm for what the child is doing. It also might entail developing a structured, consistent discipline plan. You can teach parents to give clear, direct commands and help them devise reasonable consequences for compliance and non-compliance. Emphasize the importance of follow-through and consistency as a means to achieve the desired response from the child. Be aware that some of the parents in your program might be affected by domestic violence. Domestic violence is verbal, emotional, financial, physical, or sexual abuse that one partner inflicts upon the other to maintain power and control. As you work with your client, you will want to look out for behavioral signs of abuse. She might also have chronic injuries or injuries that can't be explained and may minimize their severity. There are additional physical symptoms that are red flags. Domestic violence is a complicated issue. The victim may find it extremely difficult to leave the relationship for many reasons. 
validate these feelings, and help her access as much social support from others as possible, while reminding her that her safety and the safety of the children are of utmost importance. You can help her craft a safety plan and find community resources. Have your client identify friends or relatives who could house or otherwise support her in case of an emergency. She should also teach her children how to call for help if the situation becomes dangerous and discuss with them the best way to escape from each room in the house. If needed, connect her with a domestic violence shelter and specialist to help her stay safe and get the support she needs. Domestic violence affects the children in the family as well. Children of victims tend to cry often, experience sleep and eating disturbances, exhibit developmental delays, and appear more aggressive or withdrawn. Some counties have protocols in place for addressing domestic violence when it is occurring in a home with children present. Check with your supervisor to see what the policies are in the community where you work. Assessment of overall household safety for the child is also critical. Check whether dangerous items are properly secured and out of reach, if there are covers on all unused electrical outlets, and whether electrical cords are out of reach. You should also note if barriers exist around fireplaces and exposed heaters. To prevent choking, suffocation, or strangulation, all cords and strings, plastic bags, and small objects and toys that present a choking hazard should be inaccessible to the child. Each child in the home should have his or her own bed or crib. Crib railings should be secure and slats less than 2 and 3 eighths inches apart, which is about the width of a soda can. Also check for missing slats. All furniture should be moved away from windows and heavy furniture secured. The windows should have safety guards and locks. Make sure that there are gates at the top and bottom of staircases and the staircases are kept clear of objects. Look for working smoke detectors in every bedroom and on every level of the home. Carbon monoxide detectors should also be on every level of the home and outside sleeping areas. If any part of the house seems dangerous, help the parent come up with solutions to make the home safer for the child. Let's focus for a few minutes on the structure of the home visits. No two visits will be alike, but you might choose to start each session by asking about the well-being of the members of the immediate family using broad, open-ended questions. For example, how is this week going for you? Or, how have things been going with the kids since the last time I was here? Give the family some time to talk about how they have been doing since you last saw them before you discuss the day's agenda. Some areas to cover at the beginning of each session include progress on the family's goals, how activities introduced in the last visit went, follow up on outside services if the family has been referred elsewhere, and any new concerns the parents have. You might then talk about the goals of the current visit and work with the parent to plan the activities for the day's appointment. You may have your own plans for the visit, but it is important to incorporate the parents' ideas and goals as well. Allowing family members to be active participants in the treatment plan is likely to enhance rapport and overall compliance. It is important, however, that you don't allow each visit to be spent problem-solving current family crises. You must create a balance between meeting a family's immediate needs and working on previously agreed upon goals. During the visit, you and the parent will carry out numerous activities linked to promoting desired outcomes. These might include playing with the child or routines like feeding and dressing. Throughout these activities, you will monitor the interactions of the parent and child and introduce new skills and information where appropriate. You can also model practices for the family and explain how they support child development. Finally, you and the parent together will decide on activities she will carry out regularly at home. At the end of each session, you should recap the major takeaways from the visit, review the child's progress, and go over the plan for the next session and the intervening time. At this point, you can also provide the family with relevant resources or referrals. Before leaving, thank the family for their time and effort. Documenting the visit should, whenever possible, occur immediately afterwards while the experience is still fresh in your mind. 
documentation may be necessary for service reimbursement and is always helpful for guiding the intervention and tracking progress. It also helps resolve any conflicting accounts of what transpired during your sessions. Your agency's protocol will dictate what is included in your notes. Any major events like injuries, deaths, or suspected abuse and neglect should certainly be documented before researching or reporting them. Finally, it might be helpful to leave reminders to yourself of what to follow up on during your next visit. Refer to persons in the notes by their name and their relation to the child and write clearly and concisely using objective, non-judgmental language. Notes should include the visit's date, time, duration, and the type of service provided. Most agencies have a preferred style of note-taking for charting purposes. Be sure you check with your supervisor regarding agency protocol. The intervention phase of many home visiting programs involves modeling and parent education. When working with the children, you can demonstrate healthy parent-child interactions and practices and explain the rationale for your actions. Specifically, you can use modeling during playtime to help the parent recognize the skills the child is developing, such as self-regulation, problem solving, or language and motor skills, and teach the parent strategies for reinforcing those skills. You should also educate parents about typical child development and describe how they can support the developmental and emotional needs of their child. You can offer concrete information about brain development and the behaviors that are typical at each developmental level. Point out the skills the child is developing, teach appropriate discipline, and suggest games, songs, and other practices to support the child's cognitive, social, and emotional development. Simply acknowledging when parents utilize new skills or practice positive parenting techniques is a great way to subtly reinforce those behaviors. The parent might also need information about nutrition, treatment of common medical ailments, and activities to build the child's motor skills. You can check for understanding by asking parents to practice or explain what was introduced, but you should take care to avoid asking in a way that demeans the parents or suggests that you are quizzing them. One strategy is to inform the parent that you are asking for their input to determine if you are explaining everything clearly enough. In addition to providing new knowledge and skills, point out to parents what they already do to facilitate the child's development and well-being. For example, you might explain how everyday activities, such as feeding, dressing, and playing, can aid the child's development. You can empower the parent to continue these daily learning activities between visits. Know the limits of your professional skills and the agency services. When the services and resources needed are beyond the scope of what the home visiting program can provide, be prepared to connect the family to other programs in the community. Some of these resources are formal. Other beneficial sources of support are less formal. To support clients to the greatest extent possible, you should have a thorough knowledge of your clients' needs and what is available in the community. Your agency may have official written partnerships with other organizations, but you can also build partnerships through your own contact with other agencies. Creating your own partnerships with other service providers will take time. Remember that how you conduct yourself in these professional relationships can have an effect on how these other agencies view your program. If the family is interested and willing to seek help outside the home visiting program, talk to the parent about how they would like the referral to proceed. Establish if they would like to make these contacts with you present, independently, or have you make the call for them. You might need to help clients understand the process for applying and receiving outside resources and assist them with any necessary paperwork. If you need to share any confidential information with outside agencies about your clients, be sure to obtain prior written consent from the parents. You may want to keep a running list of the agencies to which you refer clients and keep track of the outcome of each referral. This will involve regularly evaluating the family's experiences with the outside agency and the extent to which they are meeting the family's needs. In this section of the training, we'll discuss how you can stay safe on the job, effectively address ethical challenges, and continually improve your clinical skills. Your safety is of utmost importance, 
so visit preparation always involves establishing safety precautions. As the saying goes, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Talk to your supervisor about agency-wide safety protocols before going out on your first visit. If none exists, you can ask your supervisor to create one. You might also consider taking self-defense classes and requesting additional police presence in the neighborhoods you're visiting if you know you will be entering a particularly unsafe area. Before each visit, be sure other staff members know where you are going and how long you plan to be gone. If it is the first visit to a home, directions and a map will help you avoid getting lost in an unfamiliar and potentially dangerous neighborhood. Wear shoes with which you can move freely in the event you need to escape quickly from a risky situation. Carry minimal cash, leave expensive jewelry, purses, and other personal belongings at home, and always have a cell phone on hand for emergencies. It is also best to visit homes in teams whenever possible, especially for first visits. Families are good resources too, regarding what areas to avoid and the best times to visit. When you arrive at the house, be sure to park in a well-lit, visible location with a safe path to the house. Ensure your car doors and windows are locked and that anything of value is securely stashed out of sight. Be alert as you walk to the house. If you think you are being followed, try to go to a public place. Once you approach the house, listen to determine if the parent is home and to assess how safe it is to enter. If entering the home strikes you as unsafe, leave immediately. Once you've arrived at the home for the scheduled visit, greet the family and ensure the meeting time still works for them. During the visit, remain alert and trust your instincts. If you feel uncomfortable or fear for your safety, reschedule the visit. Be conscious of people coming and going and position yourself close to an exit if possible. Don't go into dark rooms or basements and leave immediately if the situation becomes violent or if a weapon is present. You may wish to have a good excuse in mind should you need it. For example, you might pretend your phone is vibrating and inform the family that it's an emergency call from the office. In addition to considering safety precautions, it is important to anticipate ethical dilemmas you might confront. While solutions to ethical problems are usually not straightforward, several principles and practices can guide your work. First, use your agency resources as a guide. Your agency likely has standards of conduct and you can work with your supervisor to develop protocols for difficult situations. These protocols should be detailed and it is important that you remain familiar with them. Be particularly conscious of confidentiality Value conflicts and boundaries. Families have a right to confidentiality, except for instances in which someone is at risk of harming themselves or others. These instances are not always black and white, however, so discussing the situation with your supervisor is always a good option. There will also be instances in which two agency or professional values will be in conflict. To resolve these conflicts, value priorities need to be set. For example, respecting the family's autonomy and expertise will typically be foremost, but if doing so puts the child at risk, child safety should take precedence. Finally, establishing boundaries between your personal and professional life is also important. For example, you may feel that sharing your personal experience will help build rapport with the family. This may be true, but any sharing should be explicitly tied to the family's concerns be concise, and aid the intervention. Learning and growing is a constant process for home visitors. To aid in that growth, you should make full use of supervision, training, and continuing education opportunities. Regular supervision is a key component of the work. With your supervisor, you will gain insights, skills, and support. Your supervisor can help you to develop your professional skills by both teaching and demonstrating the skills needed for the job. Reflective supervision is particularly useful. In reflective supervision, you clarify the goals of your work, discuss what is and is not working for your clients, and process your emotional response to the work. Experienced supervisors will offer feedback informed by their own expertise. 
To get the most out of supervision, you should arrive on time and be prepared to discuss details of the home visits, assessment outcomes, or dilemmas faced. Bringing an agenda will help you remain focused on your most important concerns. With your supervisor, you can make hypotheses about the family's experiences, but you should also be open to other interpretations of client behavior and other intervention approaches. Importantly, your supervisor's input and support can help you avoid judging yourself or others. Your supervisor can also model skills for you, engage in role plays with you to prepare for visits, help you plan upcoming visits, and teach you specific strategies you can bring to your practice. He or she is also there to help you evaluate and improve your work. Supervisors will process with you the feelings that come up during the work and suggest self-care strategies as well. For example, your supervisor can support you when you feel your work is interfering unduly with your personal life. He or she can help you recognize the signs of burnout, which include exhaustion, cynicism or pessimism, and loss of enjoyment in the work. With your supervisor, you can develop strategies for coping with the challenges of the job including establishing boundaries between yourself and your clients so that you don't take on their problems as your own. Taking time off or visiting a mental health professional can also ease the burden you feel when your work becomes too stressful. It is important to remember that you can only meet your clients' needs if your own needs are met first. Outside of supervision, you can improve your skills and knowledge through relevant training and materials. Think about what skills you need to learn or improve upon, and look for relevant conferences, workshops, seminars, classes, videos, websites, articles, and books. Team meetings and group supervision can provide you with support, expose you to different intervention styles, and allow for the sharing of insights. These meetings can also be used for building intervention skills, like active listening and relationship development. Participating in continuing education classes will help ensure that you are providing high quality services to your clients. Some classes are held in person, but you will find many courses available online as well. Several national organizations, including the National Association of Social Workers, NASW, and Association of Social Work Boards, ASWB, review continuing education providers to help ensure the courses they offer are of adequate quality lists of NASW and ASWB approved providers are available on the websites of these national organizations. Home visiting can be complex and challenging. While this training cannot provide all the knowledge and skills you will need in your work, it does offer strategies to help you prepare for your visits and expose you to some of the important issues you will likely confront. Your skill development will be an ongoing process. Because every family is unique, each case will pose different challenges. As a home visitor, you will face difficult decisions that are best made with attention to your client's values and aspirations, your agency's guidelines and principles, and input from your supervisor and other professional resources. Finally, remaining committed to self-improvement and seeking out professional development opportunities, including trainings and conferences, will not only help you become a more effective home visitor, it will likely also make your home visiting work more fulfilling and rewarding.